Welcome back to this week's OIS podcast. This week, we're featuring a live broadcast from OIS at ASRS in San Antonio, Texas. With an audience this time, Summit co-chair Dr. Firas Rehal spoke with Dr. Stanley Chang shortly after he accepted the OIS Lifetime Innovator Award for his work in retinal detachment surgery. Let's listen in. Stanley, in the beginning, and I saw some of this, and we just heard numerous uh, high-level experts talk about it, those early advances in complex vitreoretinal surgery that we've all just talked about for a few minutes, how you brought it along, how you brought along the tools, the gases. Uh, what was that like? What, what was driving the process other than your own will? Uh, how did you come up with these tools? Well, um, when I finished fellowship, during fellowship, I was exposed to SF6 gas, who uh, Ed Norton and Bob Mockamer had developed at Miami. And when I was a resident in Mass Ineer, they never used expanding gases. So when I went to Cornell, I was quite uh, interested in the subject. And uh, Harvey Linkoff, who was there, had found the family of gases called C uh, for fluoropropane, for fluorocarbon gases. And these gases, uh, one of them, C3F8, lasted uh, almost two months in the eye. <clears throat> and he's, he didn't, Harvey was not a vitrectomy, vitreous surgeon, so he asked Jack Coleman and I to use it. And uh, I, as junior faculty, you always got the worst cases. You got the failed cases, the cases nobody else wanted to do, and those would be the PVRs or the complex uh, traction detachments from diabetics. And uh, so I started to get an interest in them, and one of the problems was that we, when PVR, we had about a 25% success rate, where we put SF6 in at the end of our surgery, fix the retina, but about two or three weeks later, when the gas bubble went away, the retina would redetach. So I had a couple of those patients, and I decided I would inject Harvey's gas, C3F8, so I wouldn't have to keep inject. Uh, where you get a retinal detachment again, and we often lasered them after we injected the gas and reattached the retina. So this gas lasted um, a good six weeks in the eye. And I was thinking about this as I was, as for us was going to ask me, this is the same cycle we appear now, because in the 80s, we started doing gas injections. We injected gas in the office. We put needles in the eye. And this is uh, what root retinal surgeons routinely did to try to reattach the retina with gas. And now, 30 years later, we're injecting drugs in the eye. And at the time, 30 years ago, I was looking for a longer-lasting gas, a longer-lasting agent. Now we're looking for a longer-lasting anti-VEGF or other drug that has greater sustainability. So these cycles just return. And um, we're in the same cycle again, looking for a longer agent, longer action uh, molecule. It might be through gene therapy. It might be through uh, uh, a longer uh, model, a, a drug delivery device, or it might be a, a compound that releases more slowly. So we're looking, we're all doing injections. But if it hadn't been for retinal surgeons injecting the gas, uh, it, the intravitreal probably would have never developed on its own because we were all familiar with in, in, intravitreal injections. But now, we, in those days, we would do one or two a month. Now we're doing 10 a day. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a fascinating comparison, and until you brought it up to me, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that evolution and that idea. And I'm glad you brought it up. How do you view the development process? You, you're still involved. How do you view the development process of devices or even drugs then versus now? You, you kind of commandeered these programs in the 80s and 90s. What do you see as the differences or advantages to now, if any? Well, I think now uh, it's much harder because you could try things um, with less regulatory oversight. The regulatory oversight really makes things difficult. And also, you need a good partner because all the uh, bu the bureaucracy of getting uh, something FDA approved is so much greater. Did you face that? Uh, let's move to the other things. There, you know, the list again is long. I wanted to hear about both 
the, the heavy liquids and the okay. wide angle that right. everyone just mentioned. But did you face those kind of challenges with the heavy liquids sure. and the, and the mm -hmm. wide angle? Sure. The um, heavy liquids uh, grew out of perfluorocarbon technology because as the perfluorocarbon chain got larger, they became liquids. And we knew that they were heavy liquids, heavier than water. Uh, and uh, some other people had worked on it before, but um, we knew that perfluorocarbon itself would be very stable uh, and it would be inert. So uh, when I started working on them, I, I knew that uh, they, they were heavy enough to flatten the retina, but I had to assemble a team and I got a, uh, a fluorine chemist, a cell biologist, Janet Sparrow, and um, uh, also a, a pathologist, Dr. Iwamoto, who helped me uh, do the pathology to study these eyes. And then I uh, did uh, worked and found someone in industry to help me make uh, a pure perfluorocarbon. This, and his, unfortunately, his mother had had a retinal detachment, so he became very interested in the project. And we developed a very pure perfluorocarbon that eventually could be used clinically. And we were ready for it. And once we had done all the preliminary work uh, with the histology and the electron microscopy, I couldn't get a, any companies interested. It went to Alcon, we went to the major company stores, and at that time, Pharmacia was a company that had produced Helon, and I wanted to, uh, we wanted Helon to, to uh, Pharmacia to develop it. They took it for a year and put it on the shelf. And <laughs> after a year, they told me they weren't interested. So uh, finally, <laughs> we, uh, there was a small company started in St. Louis, based in St. Louis, called Infinitech. And they decided they would run the clinical trial. Um, and fortunately, they did a good job with the clinical trial. And I think we got the uh, dr drug approval in 18 months, which was pretty amazing. Uh, because there were a lot of people in the community already using it and uh, knew that it was quite effective. So uh, I was lucky there, but uh, it took a long time to find the partner. And then uh, a f this chemist that I had worked with started his own company to ma manufacture the perfluorooctane. And uh, he also gave it to Morfield so they could have it for their patients. And then finally, to have a, a, a partner like Alcon come in, they were a great partner when they took over at these two small companies. Somebody had to teach how to use perfluoron, how to keep it safe, and also to monitor the safety throughout the rest of the world as people were adopting this technology. So Alcon was a wonderful partner in educating our surgeons and then um, making sure that the regulatory aspects were followed. And I think that during that period of time, I was really uh, very fortunate to have a, a great corporate partner who could help us. They didn't always listen to all my suggestions, <laughs> but somehow it, it uh, is a lasting contribution that um, I was lucky to have made. We weren't so... Uh, we weren't so lucky with the uh, wide-angle viewing. Avi is a, as a one-man company. And how did we start that? Well, I, the Volk had developed a quadrispheric lens, which is a wide-field lens, and we were all quite impressed with that early on. I said, why can't we use this lens in the operating room so that we could... Um, see real uh, a panoramic view of the retina. We could see the entire retina when we're in the operating room instead of seeing a little 30-degree field of view. And so Avi had come to me and he, he was interested in this idea and he had already developed an inverter because the image is inverted and reversed. And then we uh, worked together to miniaturize the uh, lenses that we could use in surgery, and it, it changed the way we did. Again, it's another uh, field that uh, it's difficult to get someone to make those lenses because the market size was limited. And um, it, 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 was a, it was a great problem with the Volk company where we made the prototypes through Volk, but Volk uh, 
claim the uh, intellectual property. <laughs> and so <laughs> it was always a, uh, a struggle to deal with them as a, as a company. But ultimately, it's the surgeons that changed the, the um, you know, and you had friends like you saw on the screen here, Harry Flynn, Mark Boomkrantz, Hillel Lewis, they all took to this technology so rapidly that uh, it became incorporated into our routine care. So I'm grateful to them, not only for their comments, but also their help in getting this technology developed and used in day-to-day -day practice. Amazing, there's so much there. Uh, when Stanley was uh, recounting the first year or two of taking the perfluorocarbon liquids out to uh, corporate America and being denied sounds like Michael Jordan's 10th grade uh, basketball coach <laughs> not letting him make the team. I wonder what those folks would think uh, now. I, I'm sure if you bring products now, they probably pay attention. Um, <laughs> thank you, Stanley. What about, uh, I don't want to keep you too long, but what about moving forward in those two areas, tamponades, um, Viewing systems, as yeah. you know, have evolved a lot. I still use the contact system that you just described. A lot of younger surgeons are using non-contact systems, which I feel might be a little inferior in quality. But what's your yeah. thought on that and the and the tamponades? Well, I think uh, Maria is right, and uh, we don't want a tamponade where the patient has to keep their head down for weeks. Uh, if we could develop a tamponade where they can fly, they don't have to keep their head down, and the retina would heal. Hydrogels seem to be the future, and I think there are many, quite a few people working on hydrogels now. Uh, I'm a little worried about this technology because the, the volume and the dollar volume is not going to be a high one. So we have to do things not only for money, but also really for the benefit of our patients. And uh, I hope that some company will, will develop it and will be able to make it some profit, but uh, also, really, it'll be a big help to patients and change the way we do things. Uh, in terms of my advice to people, I would say make sure that when you try to introduce something new, make sure that it's going to have a lasting effect and it's not going to be um, have problems in the future. And secondly, oh, if, if for our doctors, find a good partner because that's so important in getting your technology developed and uh, working and taught around the world. Young companies take note about the hydrogel comment. I think that uh, perfluoron thing worked out pretty well for Alcon, so you might wanna <laughs> take heed. Stanley, I can't thank you enough for taking time to come, and um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, so thank you for listening, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the OIS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our iTunes channel so you get the latest ophthalmology insights. Got a story of your own to tell? Apply to be a guest at ois.net.